A very good morning to each one of you. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. It's 8.30 exactly, and we are about to commence with our training program for the day. So a warm welcome to all of you that are joining F the first workshop for the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub for the year. And we look forward to many exciting workshops ahead as well as we engage with some of the critical issues around what does it mean to be an online learner at UNISA? Now, many of you are here for particularly looking at how the assessment will work for your upcoming supplementary exams. And we want to provide you with an orientation to ease you into this transition. So in today's program, you will find we will cover key aspects that are designed to help you smoothly transition into the space of online assessments. It's my privilege today to also welcome uh, our colleagues, but let me firstly welcome our Acting Executive Dean, uh, Dr. Moses Mangwane, who will address you shortly. We then have uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Pandiwe Kamalani, who is also the ODAL Executive, uh, and she is the one that strategically coordinates the exams as part of UNISA as well. And then we have the ADOV team with us. Good morning to those colleagues as well, joining us on the Saturday morning. And we also have members of the academic uh, staff and support staff in the College of Account Accounting Sciences. So very good morning to each one of your colleagues, and thank you very much for joining us on the Saturday to provide this strategic training to our students. So let us quickly look at the program and some uh, ground rules for the upcoming session. So we'll have a uh, we'll have the executive uh, dean address us sh shortly. We'll then have cover topics such as downloading your papers, uploading your script. We'll also cover little, little aspects on academic integrity. What does it mean for us as an institution? And then I know many of you are stressed out about the proctoring tools, IRS, etc. And this is new to many of you. So we will cover this so that we ease you into how you actually use the tool. And we have the expertise from the colleagues of uh, science, uh, engineering, and technology who have already implemented and used these tools to guide you this morning. We'll also cover some aspects on required devices, what do you need for this particular exam, and then we also want to prepare you a little bit about online assessment skills, what do you need, and finally some support contact center information, and then we'll round up with a Q&A session. So good morning to each one of you that have joined us. I see we have a few more that have now joined us and the numbers are picking up, so it's an exciting session ahead. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you would all also note that the, the uh, microphones and cameras are disabled for many of our participants. Now, the reason for that is we have intentionally did this. It's not broken on your side. It's, in, it's an intentional uh, uh, factor for us so that we have a smooth transition into the online workshop for the day. However, we want to encourage you to post your comments in the chat. So on your device, you will find that you have a little icon called chat. Right. So if you find the chat icon, I want you quickly to, to just post in good morning, right? So that we know that you are with us. So just post in good morning in the chat and you will use this chat function to basically put up your questions. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Good morning to you as well uh, and the rest of you that are joining in. Uh, so you will use this chat function to communicate with us. We have a group of colleagues that are in the background, both from the Academic Development Open Virtual Lab, plus the College of Account Sciences that will filter the questions and uh, post comments and respond to you. And towards the end of the session, we will also have a Q&A session where we will filter some of your questions from the chat itself. So this is a very important tool for you as you communicate with us. So let us begin our program. It is my pleasure at this time to quickly invite to the platform, our virtual platform, the, ex the acting executive dean for the College of Accounting Sciences, Dr. Moses Nwane, who will provide some context and some preliminary words for us. Thank you very much, Doc, for joining us. I know it's Saturday morning, early morning on your side as well. And we also appreciate you taking the time to address the students on this important development with UNISA. Let me hand over the platform to you, Dr. Nwane. Um, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Let me start by saying, uh, good morning, Chakani, Macheroni. Ashini Molueni uh Dumelang Hoye More. I'm I'm just trying program director to make sure that the the African University shaping futures 
in service of humanity, we, we, we also uh, show that we are indeed Africanized. So for those uh, languages that I've not covered, um, I, I will be improving as time goes on. But um, yeah, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Let me first start by acknowledging colleagues from CPD, DSAA, School of Account Applied Accountancy, CSET, ADOF, and the Executive Director of Odell, and most importantly, our students. And also, not forgetting the organizers of this workshop. Your efforts and willingness to assist the College of Accounting Sciences, especially on a study working over time, cannot go unnoticed, and we highly appreciate it. So, colleagues, um, we 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 sincerely appreciate uh, your your efforts. I would like to start by apologizing to our students program that for every inconvenience that we might have caused on their side, as they are the most important stakeholders, Chair, it is important that we, we do apologize where we have caused them an inconvenience and we do acknowledge as the college that yes, there was an inconvenience uh, on, on their side. As the college, we were overwhelmed by the increase in CTA students who have engaged in academic misconduct by cheating copying directly from unauthorized material and in severe cases a program director purchasing services from third parties to write on their behalf as you know this kind of behavior is an and misconduct does not only damage their academic record but also undermines the integrity of unisa's CA programs and brings the reputation of the chartered accountancy profession into disrepute. We have seen a number of students um, being suspended from the academic program due to misconduct of cheating. So we would love to actually make sure that we minimize these as we all know that the accounting profession is known to safeguard the integrity of governance system within the organizations, being public and private. Therefore, as institutions of higher learning, it is important that we produce graduates with relevant skills and attributes by offering quality programs that are registered and fully accredited. The integrity of our assessments plays very important role in assuring quality of our offerings and therefore producing quality graduates. The 2022 October November was the worst in terms of the increment in students' misconduct and cheating. As the college, therefore, we decided to engage various departments, including DSAA, of the institution to investigate alternative assessment methods to improve academic integrity within the CTA supplementary examinations. That necessitated us to postpone the examinations from January to March 
in order to allow us time to investigate the best method that we can use. Subsequently, the college had considered a hybrid method which would entail students writing in allocated venues using their laptops and invigilated by warm bodies. And that's what was communicated to our students. However, the following matters were identified. We had a challenge that some of the students had not responded to the questionnaire that was distributed by the School of Applied Accountancy for venue selection. It would therefore not be possible to allocate these venues to all these students. The institution was unable to find venues for international students as well as other students based in South Africa. This would mean that those students would have to write the exams at their own spaces with no human invigilation, which would render inconsistency in conducting our examinations, which would be in contrary of the assessment policy and the assessment procedure manual of the institution. Some students indicated that they have printers at their homes and that they need to print question papers after downloading. This would mean that we would now have to provide hard copies or printed question papers, which would now defeat the hybrid method and also poses another risk. As we remember that during venue-based our question papers were leaked. Some were, hi were, were hijacked while in transit to examination venues. Due to the above and other risks, IRIS was therefore considered to be an alternative mode of assurance of assessment integrity for the CA supplementary examination. Let me also remind our students that the current economic conditions requires students who are technologically advanced and prepared. As we are also aware that our college is in the process of implementing the CA 2025, which also uh, requires students to be uh, to, to be uh, trained on digital acumen. We are in the four IR space. It is also important that I remind our students that the University of South Africa has adopted strategy to be fully online by 2030. Therefore, the intention of the university is to improve the controls in order to assure the integrity of our assessments, ensure the quality of our offerings in order to ensure continued accreditation by SACWA and professional bodies such as SICA and other accounting bodies. Let me end by my address by thanking all institutional stakeholders for making sure that this workshop take, takes place and that we are supported by all means during these times not forgetting our students who also took their time and make sure that they attend this workshop. It is an indication that they take their studies very serious and they take their career very serious. All the best to all our CTA students who will be participating in these exams. I, we humbly request that you give UNISA a best and memorable gift on its celebration for the 150 years of its existence by making sure that you pass these exams. May God grant you all the strength to deal with all the pressures. Thank you, stay blessed, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate that.
Thank you for setting the context for our students and uh, unpacking how we actually reached this decision. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students, you would have heard the ex acting executive dean stress the importance of uh, the integrity of the of the assessment and how uh, various factors have come to this point of where we have uh, came to this decision, and also it has been a journey with varying factors considered uh, to the to come into this particular decision on how it will be implemented. I know many of you have raised critical questions on the chat, and I'm hoping that if uh, our acting executive dean is still with us, that he he will also respond in the chat to some of your questions. I'm not going to open up the mic because we do have a full program, but I think if you post your questions on the chat, we have a, a full cohort that will be able to respond to some of this. And we still have the acting executive dean with us as well to provide. But he set the context for us, colleagues. And I know that even as you write your assessment at UNISA, at the end of the day, you really want your certificate worth its merit. And this is why the integrity issue has been stressed by the acting executive dean, that it is very, very important that we not just take your money and that we give you a quality certificate that carries its weight at the end of the day. So with that said, um, we, with that said, we let us proceed with how this will actually be implemented and what we need to do for the upcoming uh, session. It's my privilege now to actually welcome my next colleague. So we're going to discuss downloading um, the exam papers. How do you actually download the exam papers? Where will you find it? Uh, it's a new space for many of you. So that's a basic thing that we want to start with. Where would you find your exam paper? How do you download it? What do you do? And let me invite my colleague Richard Wright, who is an educational technology specialist and a member of Adobe, uh, to, to provide some kind of guidance for us. Welcome, Richard. Uh, and let me hand over to you as you unpack this for us. Thanks. Thank you, Denzel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we won't be very long. I'm sure all of you want to get back to your preparations. So we're just going to go through the process of how do you actually download your paper and then also upload your paper. If you've written an uh, online exam with uh, UNISA before, you would know the process is a bit different uh, for this one. So uh, firstly, as well, I just want to acknowledge that my NISA is, or my modules particularly, is giving login problems this morning. So ICT has been informed, so the uh, problems should be resolved very soon. But firstly, you will not be using the My Exams portal. So it will actually be on the My Modules portal where you access your exam papers. So what you need to do, you log into My NISA, you click on My Modules, in the drop-down for the available courses, there will be one for your supplementary exams. Within that course, there will be a folder from which you can download your papers. So you will download paper one and two from the supplementary exams course folder. So it won't, won't be under the, uh, how can I say, the general folders. We usually download folders. There will be a specific folder for the question papers. Once you've downloaded the papers, that is when you start IRIS on your de device. You will complete your question papers on a notepad, so you have to write it out. And then once you have completed writing your exam, you will scan in the script to PDF to a PDF file. You will upload the PDF document to my admin, assessment admin, assignment submissions. So remember, you're not going to submit it on my modules. This will actually be under my admin. So uh, if we quickly have a look at the process, you just open up a web page over here. So you will access my UNISA. So remember, you're not going to use the uh, exams portal. So you will just log into my UNISA with your student number and password. From here, you will click on my modules. As you can see this morning, we do have an error on this page. So that will be resolved uh, very soon. But under my modules, as you usually access your course material, there will be a specific course for the supplementary exams. Within that uh, um, supplementary exams will be a folder from which you download your uh, exam papers. So once you've downloaded your exam papers, that is when you start the IRIS invigilation. You write out everything on a notepad while IRIS is running. Once you are ready, you will scan in your documents. So we will have a look at a tool, for instance, on that you can use on your mobile phone for scanning in, in case you don't have access to a scanner. Then once you've completed scanning everything in, you will log in, you'll go to My Admin. So remember, it's not going to be My Modules where you submit, it will be under My Admin. 
And you'll see there's a assessment admin uh, drop down over here. And then you just go under assignment submission. So you'll just have to log in again with your password. Uh, so here you will then have the option to upload your scripts in PDF format. So once you complete that upload, you then stop the iris invigilation. So just as a summary, so firstly, it's just the, uh, the five steps that's basically on the screen. You're going to download your paper from my modules. You will start the iris. You will write your exam paper on uh, your answers on a, a notepad. You will then scan these with a, uh, uh, with a scanner, or you can use your phone as well. And then you will upload this to my admin. And that is then when you stop iris. So we do know a lot of you might not have access to a scanner. So you can actually use your mobile device as well to scan in physical papers. The app that uh, I would recommend is um, OneDrive for, uh, for your mobile device. You can log in with your student, MyUnisa, uh, MyUnisa My Life email address and your MyUnisa password. And then the files will also be automatically backed up in the cloud. So you'll see at the bottom, there's a little icon. That's almost like a camera shutter. You use this tool, you can scan in multiple pages uh, and it will actually center it nicely and make it look like a scanned in document. So I definitely recommend this tool because it then will save the file to your OneDrive account, your MyLife uh, OneDrive account. So you've got a backup of it. You can then access it from your computer as well, or you can uh, submit the file directly from your OneDrive to my admin admin portal so this uh, app is available for ios and android so if you've got for instance a iphone or a samsung device it should work if you are using for instance a huawei phone just have a look at alternative apps that is also available to scan in with pdf as onedrive you will have to uh how can i say jump through a little bit of hoops to download it on a huawei phone but there is alternatives available as well. So please explore this before you actually go for the examinations. Open up the app, scan in a few pages, get comfortable with how it works. It will save it as a PDF that is ready to upload. Now, a lot of times you might also find, okay, now I've uploaded all these pages and now maybe they were saved individually or maybe they or the file is way too big. The resolution of the images are too big and now it doesn't want to upload. So luckily there is a, a online tool. It's called ilovepdf.com. And this actually allows you to quickly merge PDFs. You can even edit the PDF, for instance, remove some pages if some of the pages were scanned in incorrectly. Uh, but also most importantly, it can compress the PDF. So if the resolution is very high, you can actually put it through here as well to get it under that size limit for uploading. Just make sure before you, if you do compress the PDF, just make sure everything is still legible on the paper. And that also applies to any scanning in what that you do. Just go through all the pages, make sure everything is legible. So I definitely recommend this website, ilovepdf.com. If you have any problems uh, or you want to converge a PDF or it's a file is too big, or you just want to remove some of the pages. Another thing that's also very valuable of this, say the tool that you're using uh, to scan in your documents saves it as a JPEG. So you're sitting with all these different JPEGs. You can actually use this tool to convert it to PDF and merge them into one document. Now, as you might know, for your examinations, as you can see, it's going to work a bit different. So it won't be uh, uh, the My Exams portal that you will be using. You will download from uh, my modules, the question papers, you will upload to the assignments tool on my admin. Um, and you will uh, will be using the iris invigilation. Now, before we actually go have a look why, uh, how the proctoring tool is working, we've got our expert Lazarus here today that will guide you through exactly how the tool works. But let's first see why is it so important that we are using this uh, um, proctoring tools to secure the examinations. Thank you, Thank Denzel. You. Thank you very much, Richard, for that. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you will see that uh, Richard has basically how uh, I identified and outlined 
how the process will work. Uh, we are hoping that before the end of the session that our uh, my my modules will be up and running and we can then do a live demonstration for you on this as well. However, if we do not have my modules up and running, we will do a short video clip on uh, which, which actually shows you a screen capturing of the process and we will also circulate that on this link for you on the chat for you as well at later. So let's hope by the time we finish that the, the my module set will be up and running for that live demonstration. Now I see many questions regarding Iris. Show us Iris, show us Iris. What is Iris? Uh, how does it work? And I know there's a lot of anxiety and anxiousness around that. But before we get to that point, I also see some of our students are addressing the issue of plagiarism. Let's sort this out. You are absolutely right. And going back to what the acting ED has mentioned, the issue of academic integrity and the integrity of the qualification. So let us start before we jump into Iris. Let us start with a short video clip on what exactly is academic integrity and what does it mean for us as institution? What is why is this so important? So I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Richard to play the clip for us. And this is a video that is recorded by our colleague, uh, Dr. Ingrid Murray, who unpacks what academic integrity is for us. Thank you, Richard. Dear students, as you begin your preparation for your online exams, I want to talk to you about academic integrity and the online assessment process and why it is so important for us to think about academic integrity. At university, behaving with academic integrity is founded um, in certain personal values. If you value honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, courage, then you have the foundations to become a scholar and future employee or employer who behaves with integrity. Practicing honesty means not only being honest with others, but with yourself. Those who are honest will promote the value of trust by preparing work that is thoughtful and original. Showcase your academic integrity by being fair. Acknowledge the work of others by appropriately referencing and remember that your actions can have an impact on your fellow students. In being fair, you need to show respect for yourself and for others. Respect for self means tackling challenges without compromising your own values. Respect for others means valuing their diversity of opinions and their needs and goals. Take responsibility in your university life by standing up against wrongdoing, resisting negative peer pressure and serving as a positive example which means you will need to have courage to follow through holding yourself and others accountable. So what happens if a fellow student acts in a dishonest manner? At an individual level, students that act in a dishonest way in their studies also act dishonestly in their workplaces. So if you are caught cheating at university, it could have serious consequences, not only for yourself, but for others as well. What might seem like a small action can have a domino effect. Students that cheat give the university that they come from and the qualification that they come away with a bad reputation. Employers may choose not to hire graduates from that university. Quality assurance bodies such as the Council of Higher Education and professional associations such as the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants may decide that the degrees from that university are not of an acceptable quality and decide to do de accredit the degrees. The result, even students that do not cheat during their studies are in danger of having their degrees devalued because the university as a whole is devalued. Now this is all well and good, 
but I haven't given you any examples of what academic dishonesty is so that you can take action to protect your degree. Then there are many forms uh, academic dishonesty can take. Let's start with contract cheating or ghostwriting. Some dishonest people are going to attempt to sell you the answers for exams. This is called contract cheating or ghostwriting. These people or services will get the exam paper through illegal means and dishonest people. They attempt to work out the answers and then offer these answers for sale. These people may even give students tips to try and fool their lecturers, such as changing the order of answers or making deliberate mistakes. But what also happens is sellers will give the same answers to more than one student. The result? There are always a few students who don't make any changes and from these the rest are found out. If you encounter this situation, report it to your lecturer or even anonymous, anonymously to the whistleblower hotline. What also has started happening is that these sellers, these ghostwriters, come back and blackmail students afterwards. So you are not only in danger from the university finding out, but also from somebody blackmailing you throughout the rest of your career. Linked to contract cheating is the act of buying or selling of an assessment for ghostwriters to come up with the answers to exam papers. They first need to get access to these papers. It is a serious offence to buy or sell question papers and the university will take serious actions against any person accused of this. Another form of contract cheating is to ask or pay another person to write an exam on your behalf in real time. That person will attempt to present themselves online with your credentials. However, with UNISA's use of IRIS, the proctoring software, we can determine if multiple assessments are being written from the same location and by one person uh, through, through um, looking at the webcam photos. Students often form study groups that are a wonderful source for both a study and emotional support. However, some form groups where they help each other cheat, even without meaning to. Sitting together and working together as a group to answer questions is not allowed during the exams. The best way to avoid sharing answers is to make very clear rules amongst your, amongst your study group. Act with trust and honesty, even when your lecturers can't see you. Plagiarism is when you use someone else's ideas without acknowledging them. This includes any source of information that you may use in your exam answers, words, images, music. If it doesn't come from your own head, it must be cited and referenced. All sources must be acknowledged at the end of your work as a list of sources consulted or bibliography and in your text as an in-text citation. One last, ex um, our last example refers to the upload time at UNISA. This time is not part of your writing time. When your writing time is finished, you need to stop and either save or upload your file as a PDF or scan a handwritten answer into a PDF and then submit. Make sure the PDFs are accessible. That means having no restrictions on it and readable. You can test this before the exams by saving a Word document as a PDF um, or scanning, practicing scanning and making sure that you know how to do this. The upload time is used by the university to help resolve any upload issues. If you choose to ignore this rule and continue to write, only to experience a real issue in the dying minutes, be aware that the university will not, under any circumstances, accept your script outside of this upload time. So what does the university do when it becomes aware of transgressions? And this includes the transgression of not using the prescribed proctoring software. 
There is a formal process that is followed when lecturers identify cases of plagiarism. This includes the lecturers gathering all the evidence needed and marks being withheld while the investigation takes place. Students are issued a warning letter and can decide to accept or contest the charges. If students contest the charge, a formal hearing is set and guilt determined on the probability of evidence. If found guilty, sanctions are implemented. Students can be represented by a fellow student or an SRC member. Students may appeal a guilty verdict, but the appeal is final. Sanctions can vary, vary from failing the module and, and having to re-register to a suspension from six months to five years. Sanctions also appear on your academic record and will follow, will follow you throughout your career as any time you apply for a job, your academic record will show that you acted without integrity. Serious and repeated cases will have more serious sanctions. Cancellation of all credits that you have already accumulated. If your degree is registered with a professional council, they may not allow registration with that body, meaning that you will not be able to practice for the degree that you studied. Acting ethically is a choice you make, but there are things you can do. Practice skills such as referencing and paraphrasing. Plan your time. Most students found guilty of academic infractions indicate that a lack of time made them desperate. Ask for help from reliable sources, such as your lecturers or your NISA tutors. And be careful of people on Telegram offering assistance and help. They are out to make money at the expense of your degree. Mostly, do something you love. Lastly, I know it can be hard, but courageousness is a huge part of um, academic integrity. Students that act dishonestly put all your hard work, along with the work and qualifications of all past and future students at risk. As more and more of you choose the values of academic integrity, your qualifications are protected and you become a key player in securing your future work prospects. If you would like to report any instances of academic dishonesty, you can report it to your lecture or to the whistleblower hotline with the details that's on the screen. Thank you and good luck with your exams. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for that presentation and for unpacking some of the challenges that we have at UNISA. She's noted a very critical one where uh, many service providers that provide you the service of writing your exams, etc. And we have many students that have uh, many cases that have come to university where these students are then blackmailed uh, for providing more funds throughout their career. So this is something that's where we, we want to caution you right at the outset of the challenges that we are aware of as an institution. In many cases, when these students do not pay uh, the people that they ask to write, we have emails sent to the university with evidence of what has been done. And this is where the university takes these cases up. So this is quite important for you that you understand that the reason why we are unpacking academic integrity, the reason why we are putting some of these mechanisms in place is as a result or a consequence of what has been brought to UNISA in terms of how the, the qualification integrities are being challenged in this space. So please keep that in the back of your mind at the end of the end. We're stressing this part of integrity of the qualification itself. Now, I see many questions that are coming about load shedding, about bathroom breaks, etc. And we'll unpack that a little bit as we go on. So please just wait on those questions as we come closer to those kind of issues that we will address. Uh, at this time, we will now move on to proctoring tools. What exactly are proctoring tools in use at UNISA? You will only be using one proctoring tool, but there are certain processes that need to be followed as well. So before we unpack Iris, the proctoring tool itself, let me invite my colleague Richard again to talk a little bit about proctoring tools and the profile photos, etc. Richard, thank you. Okay, thank you, Denzel. So as you might be aware, UNISA actually uses quite a few different proctoring tools. Um, so, but for you, you will face mainly focus on the iris proctoring tool. But let's first have a look on the profile photo. So on my modules, you do need to upload a profile photo. So this is a requirement for every student in the university. So if you have not done so uh, yet, my uh, modules is working again. So please, uh, uh, you can go log in even now today while we actually doing this session and just upload a profile picture that you take with your phone. So 
once you log into uh, my modules, you just click on your username at the top right. You click on, uh, it will display a drop down menu. You click on profile, and then you'll be able to select the edit profile link that's available. I'm just going to show you here with the laser pointer. So you basically log in, you click on your profile, the top right, and then you click on profile, and then you can click on edit profile. So from here, it will give you a lot of sections that you can uh, with all your credentials, but just go to scroll down to user picture and then select a file to upload from here. So the files that works the best is usually, you know, in a landscape mode or um, in a square. Uh, if you have, for instance, a, a portrait picture, it might turn the picture 90 degrees. Uh, so remember, it doesn't matter if the photo is 90 degrees as long as your face is clearly visible. So for these profile pictures, you can't use an avatar or uh, any other pictures. It must be a picture of your face where you are clearly visible. And this is just used in combination with various proctoring tools to ensure uh, your identity. Now, as we mentioned, there is quite a few different proctoring tools. So we've got the Moodle proctoring that's built in, and there's the Invigilator app that runs separately on your mobile device. And then we've got Iris Invigilation. So this is the one that you will be using for your exams. And remember, Iris Invigilation only works on your desktop or laptop. It does not run on your mobile device. But for this section, I'm going to hand over to uh, Lazarus that will take you through all the steps on setting up Iris. Uh, thank you, Denzel. Thanks, thanks, Richard, for that. So, colleagues, just remember, uh, as Richard mentioned, you can go and try this out in the meantime, uh, because remember, my modules is now up and running, and we will do a live demonstration of Richard's earlier presentation towards the end of it. So, we'll recap this live on my modules uh, towards the end of the session. But for now, the critical moment, the Iris Invigilator app. Yes, everybody is posting on this app. How does it work? What does it? Uh, uh, can I stand up? What exactly is it looking for? So, let's invite uh, Lazarus uh, Aaron from the College of Science, Engineering and Technology, who in, in a space that they've been using Iris for almost two years already. So uh, Lazarus, thank you very much for taking this opportunity to walk our students through how Iris actually works, but also for drawing some examples and some issues that you may have encountered in the College of Science, Engineering and Technology and how this was addressed so that the students are also prepared for what they are about to embrace in terms of the Iris. Thank you very much, Lazarus. Thanks, Denzel, and morning, students. Uh, so, like uh, Denzel mentioned, we've been using CSET has been using Iris now for for three years since since 2010, since COVID, and since we started with online examinations. Uh, we there was this, the same questions that you guys are asking on the chat were asked uh, three years ago by our students, but they actually in the end. Uh, to adapt and I think uh, as uh, it was said earlier that we UNISA is trying to move into the for our environment uh, so we need to as as students as uh, lecturers academics think we need to learn to adapt uh, to the new way of doing things and I think in CSET a lot of the students have adapted we have had We've got a lot less queries this, uh, at, currently, so many more students have actually adapted to using Iris. Uh, so let's let's just uh, go through the Iris setup instructions. So what is Iris? Uh, Iris is an invigilation software program that we use at UNISA uh, for assurance of assessment integrity and remote assessment. Iris records video, audio, computer screen activity. Uh, during the entire exam, it analyzes information using machine learning and automatically flags potential academic dishonesty. It also has a GPS location. What is very important to note here that even though Iris flags potential academic dishonesty, it is a person that ultimately determines in the end whether you cheated or not. So it is not the machine. The machine might flag you, but someone in our exams department will look through all recordings that are flagged. Actually, we don't just look through all the recordings that are flagged, we look through all recordings in general. So even if you're not flagged, we'll still look through your recordings. So it is a person, if you are 
uh, if the decision is made that you are, have cheated, it is a person that has made the decision, not IRS. So if you if you you see that you move a lot, or uh, and you're scared about moving, or you're scared about that, you know, you you uh, I just tell you to look at the computer screen. Please don't worry about that. We can tell by looking uh, at your recordings whether you've done something that's uh, dishonest or not. IDAS also has GPS location, so we can use it to determine whether uh, students have been sitting close to each other. How uh, does IDAS work? Okay, so in, like I mentioned, uh, when it is running, it records audio and video and screen activity. This is the pop up uh, that you'll see on the screen. You'll see yourself in the on this uh, video. You'll actually see yourself being recorded and it takes screenshots every few seconds of your screen so it we can determine whether what you, whether you've gone to Google or gone to a, another application uh, that is not allowed we can determine that by when we look at the your recordings what is the necessary equipment you need a stable internet connection you need a laptop or desktop artist does not work on phones or tablets, so it is important that you have a laptop or a desktop. If you don't have one now, we suggest you uh, plan to uh, arrange with a friend or something. But it is you have to have a desktop, laptop or desktop. So borrow one if you, if you if you don't have one. You need an external built-in microphone. So most laptops will have built-in microphones, uh, but if you're using a desktop, you'll need an external desktop and an external web camera. We recommend the minimum specifications of your computer to be 4 gigabyte RAM and Windows 7 64 bit. Most computers would actually have this. Uh, so it's only if your computer is extremely old or your laptop is extremely old that it is uh, that it won't have 4 gigabyte RAM and Windows 7 on it. So the first thing you'll do, you will uh, download Iris and the Iris plugin on your Google on Google Chrome. So Iris works. Iris is a plugin on your browser. Uh, so you write your exam. Obviously, you download your exam through the browser, and Iris must be installed on your browser before you write your exam. You can only install it on Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge. We actually prefer that you use Google Chrome because it's. Uh, we seen that it gives students less issues. Uh, yeah. Make sure you have the latest version of your browser that you are using. Okay, so how do you go about installing the plugin? So this has to be done before you write your examination. So next week or as soon as possible. You need to do this. You need to go to the Chrome Web Store on Microsoft Edge. You will go to the the Edge Store. You will so to go to the Chrome Web Store, just Google Chrome Web Store. It'll be the first thing that pops up. Then you can click on that link, and then you'll end up here. Once you get here, you search for Iris. So you type in Iris here. The Iris extension will be the first thing that pops up. It will be this. Uh, it'll have this icon on it. You click on it. Once you've clicked on it, you click on Add to Chrome. After you click on Add to Chrome, you'll have this pop up. It will say Add Extension. It, it, it will give you this message that you can read and change all your data on websites you visit, capture content of your screen. You have to say Add Extension. After you've done that, Iris is installed in your browser. There is nothing else you have to do to install Iris, I just install. You are now ready to write an Iris invigilated exam. So what happens when it comes to exam time? You will uh, open Google Chrome. You will log on to your, well, not in your case, not examination site. You will log on to my modules. As soon as you open your assessment, Iris will pop up. The pop up that I showed you before with the lady on the screen, that's a, that Iris uh, will pop up. We'll go through it now. You will follow the IDIS instructions carefully and then you will start your test. So as I mentioned, 
uh, if you're not if if it's the first time that you're using iris and you start your exam you will have these two pop-ups come first this one will want i say iris wants to use your camera you have to click on allow iris wants to use your microphone you have to click on allow this is this happens on the first time that you use iris it won't happen again you won't have to click on allow uh, after you've done the, the, the first after you've allowed it the first time now when you open an assessment you, uh, previously it was mentioned that you actually download your assessment first so that's not correct you actually have to start iris first iris will pop up as soon as you click on the link the the folder where your assessment is loaded on iris will pop up so you need to first activate iris and then download your paper so uh, this is the pop-up that will happen you will you will have to agree to the terms and conditions you do not have to agree to data being used for research and product improvement you will then click continue after you've clicked continue this lady will start talking and giving you instructions and telling you why we use iris the first time you use iris you have to allow it to talk the whole way through or else you won't be able to click this next button but this she'll tell you that you need to complete these instructions here so you need to complete your uh, you need to act, uh, allow iris to use or choose a camera choose a microphone enter your full name and here you have to enter your student id please make sure that your student id is entered incorrectly or the system will not will pick up that if you do not enter it correctly or you enter some other numbers some students enter their normal uh, south african id number if you enter that in we won't be able to pick up that you've actually used iris so we'll get your recording but the exam system will not be able to pick up that you use iris and your exam results won't be released even though you may have used iris so please make sure your id number your student ID number is entered here and it is entered in correctly. So I will double check it. And after that, you have to hold your your camera or Iris will ask you. Sorry, not your camera. Iris will ask you to hold your student ID to the camera. Hold it as close as possible to the camera. Uh, and then it then click on capture ID. Now uh, if you do not have your a student card with a picture on it, you are allowed to use a, a South African ID document or your driver's license yeah, an identification with a picture of you on it. So Iris actually uses this to determine the picture determine to determine whether the person writing is actually on the picture. Sometimes it not. Sometimes your picture might, if you're using an ID, for a South African ID, for instance, the picture might be an old picture. Can okay, you? In many, most students' cases, it's not. But in some students, it might be an old picture. Don't worry about that. If if you are not automatically um, uh, authenticated, we we authenticate you manually. Okay. So then the next step is. Sorry, I'm hoping you can still see my screen. You're still visible, Lazarus. All right. OK. Uh, the next step is uh, the iris will ask you to picture yourself in, in front of the screen so that it can capture your face correctly. It just wants to make sure that the face detection technology is working so it'll draw a square around your face. Uh, and then it will say ask you to click on start invigilation. After you've clicked on start invigilation, there's another step that you need to complete. A lot of students struggle at this point. On this screen, it will ask you to it will uh, ask you to share your screen on this on this little window. It will ask you permission to share your screen. You need to click on this window first you need to click on this this will be a copy of your entire screen you need to click on that before you click on here this button 
the share button is originally grayed out. You need to click on this before this button turns purple. If you click on this, this button will turn purple. You can then click on share and then you are ready to uh, write your examination. IDIS will minimize. If it does, doesn't minimize yourself, you can minimize it yourself. You can then go and download your paper and you can start writing. IDIS will be recording you. You can also, if you want to see yourself being recorded, you can maximize others and you can uh, uh, see yourself being recorded. But even though you minimize it, IRIS will still be recording you. At the end of the examination, after you've uploaded your paper and the time is up, IRIS will maximize and start uploading some files automatically. So just remember that IRIS, IRIS actually uploads files every 10 minutes. So that's why you need a stable internet connection. But at the end of the exam, there's certain other files that it needs to upload. Uh, yeah, so after it's uploaded, it will close itself and then you are done. Some maybe I need to mention here, uh, quite a few of you have asked about internet connection. If you do have an internet problem during the examination and let's say it stops working, you need to go and open that exam. Um, in your case, it's the additional resources folder. Open that folder again so that Iris can up can start again because Iris may, if you have an internet problem, Iris may stop recording and an error will pop up. So close Iris and just start Iris again and go through the process again and it will start recording. You won't be flagged for that. Uh, we can see, we will be able to see your multiple recordings and that's fine. We know that OK, you had an internet problem at some point and that's why. But if it's a long internet um, issue, then that could become a that could be a problem. Uh, yeah, if, if it's a short connection, just make sure that you're a short drop in your internet plus internet connection. Just make sure it starts again and you can continue and that's fine. Uh, at the moment, all the students that are writing the CTA supplementary exams are a link to a iris practice site on my modules you should be able to see you should be able to if you log on to my modules i see my modules is working again if you log on there you should be able to see a under under the drop down where you see your, where you can view your module codes you should be able to see cta iris practice you can go in there and you can test iris after you after you have uh, um, added it to your browser there will there is on that site also some iris troubleshooting document documentation go through that if you have any issues with iris but you need to test iris before you write your exams don't wait for the last moment because there, it could be certain there could be some issues that some of our students have issues like if have problems with like if you use a work laptop they may not allow uh, allow pop-ups uh, if you're using your work network they may not allow uh, iris uh, uh, there might be settings on your work network, so you need to double check Iris is working before you write your examination. So you need to go and do the practice examination. Um, somebody asked earlier on about uh, um, going to the bathroom. You are allowed to go to the bathroom. You just tell Iris you're going to the bathroom. Obviously, we will look at the video. You do not have to take your camera, your, your laptop, would you? You can go to the bathroom, you can come back. And then you can start writing. What is one of the requirements is just after you've uh, for CTA students, one of the requirements because you're writing open book examinations and the exam is uh, only allows us to use certain material. Uh, we we require that after you click on after you shared your screen, so you've clicked on share in the next 30 seconds, hold your laptop up and above your desk so that we can see exactly what's on your desk to make sure that only the material that you are allowed to use is on your desk. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so if you go to the bathroom and you come back, you have to do the same thing. You have to hold your laptop up and 
so that we can see for like for about 15 to yeah I would, I would say 15 to 20 seconds not necessarily 30 seconds so so that we can see that what is on your desk and what is around you is only the material that you are allowed to use uh, yeah that's it from my side um, Denzel I'm not sure I can do a, a, a live de demonstration of the iris uh, Yes, I think I, I think that's going to be important for us, Lazarus. Uh, what I'm what I suggest is that we're going to recap the yeah. entire process from Richard with uh, how to access the exam uh, paper, where do you access it, how do you download, etc. So he's going to take us because we have my modules now up and running. So he's going to take us to that entire process as a live demonstration. Then thereafter, I think it'll be ideal for our students if you then do a live demonstration following that. Uh, on how this will actually work as well. Uh, thanks, Lazarus. So you can get your side ready in the meantime for us. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me just recap. I think there's there are four important things that or four important points that came out in this presentation, right? So firstly, the process is not designed to trap every student. I see a lot of questions coming out as uh, if I suddenly move, will that be flagged? We understand that we are all human. Yes, you will have the urge to suddenly stand up for maybe a quick stand up for 30 seconds, stretch your leg and sit on back. That's that's being human, right? So we understand that these are these are things that may emerge as part of the system. So firstly, secondly, is a set of guidelines will be provided by uh, the college on what to flag with iris right so you will be it's it's not just everything will be flagged there is a set of guidelines that will be provided by the college and say these are what we would consider important for flagging right so going back to that point yes please don't take your computer to the bathroom um and i see many people are now laughing about that on the platform yes it sounds simple but we we, we just want to stress that as well that the third point is that even if you are flagged, a the decision, the final decision of whether you are considered cheating or not is not done by IRS, right? The information is provided by IRS, but a physical human being will then review the recording and make a decision based on that would, uh, to see whether that was considered cheating or not. So even if you are flagged by IRS uh, and suddenly you're I'm flagged by IRS, don't stress out in the examination and start uh, feeling anxious about it. Remember, the decision at the end of the day will be a physical human being who will go back view it and make a decision on this right then there, uh, there there are many questions on how can we have a mock exam site can we test this out before yes there is a mock a mock site that is set up and we encourage you to test that get familiar with it before you write your exams right so the, use the mock site to take away a bit of that anxiety that you are feeling right now so don't leave this towards the the moment that you are writing to get into the paper and then start working with iris get this before get used to the system before you actually start commencing with that okay so uh, there are questions about devices i see somebody also posted something about their cpu having issues etc so i'm going to ask david to talk a little bit about the required devices and the specs that we need uh david uh, this is something that's in your space so let me get you onto the platform so you can unpack this for us thanks david all right good morning students and thank you for joining us today i see there's quite a number of questions with regards to the devices rightly said uh, dr chetty um yes you can just click on co uh, continue i did see an error message there you just click on continue it should still work fine um but yes all right so with regards to smartphones now as you guys would have seen iris runs on your desktop or your laptop um okay so you're going to need to use one of those but for uploading your exam and scanning you can still use your smartphone so a couple of rules of thumb that we we tend to find help students is just to make sure that some of these items that we're going to quickly go through that you consider these things when you're getting a new phone or the phone that you currently have Preferably not older than five years, guys, because technology moves so quickly. Uh, the later version of phones tend to have better apps and they tend to function better. And they also have much bigger drive space, uh, built-in space. So it definitely will make life a lot easier for you. Always make sure your operating system's up to date. So maybe pop down to campus if you don't really have that much data. And maybe just connect to the Unisa Wi-Fi and do a quick check that all your applications are up to date, especially the operating system, because that one can be quite big to download. Yes, you will need access to the internet um, for if you're going to upload, 
your script onto the MyUnisa platform. Um, yes, so definitely internet access will be there. It's always try to have a plan B as much as possible. I know it's a very difficult situation we're all in with load shedding, uh, but try your best and just let's hope for the best on that one. Uh, space for proctoring apps. Okay, in this case, Iris is not going to run in your smartphone, as is already indicated. So, but ideally for any app scanning apps that you're going to use, just make sure you've got some space. The camera quality and the microphone and the sound. Okay, generally speaking nowadays, those tend to be pretty good. Although before you get a a new device, maybe check it out. Check out the, the latest or the version that you want to go for and make sure these three elements that you have a good check and to make sure they're up to what you would consider very good. Um, otherwise, you don't want something, a device that has very poor sound because then listening to Teams meetings like today wouldn't be that easy. So yes, so but generally most of the new devices tend to have very up-to-date characteristics. Now, here comes the interesting one. So if you've got a desktop computer at home, right? Um, I'm sure you guys might see them looking something like this. Let me just put my little pointer on. Yep, this, so this type of thing. So what you can do is you don't need to now go buy a laptop. Let's be honest, that costs a lot of money and you might not have budgeted for it. So then what you can do is just go get yourself a webcam. Um, they're pretty cheap mostly, and they usually do have built-in speakers. So just make sure you've got the mic as well uh, at your camera, and then you can convert your little desktop into pretty much not I wouldn't say a movable device, but at least you would be able to have sound and camera and be able then to use this instead of going to buy a laptop because with a laptop, yes, it is built in already. So yes, so that's something you could consider and it's quite easy to do. Now, the next thing is you might say to me, OK, David, but I've got Wi-Fi at home, but I don't have a, a network connection. So what you can then do is You've got these little USB connectors that connect you to the Wi-Fi. They cost about just over 100 Rand. I did see it on Takealot. I'm not advertising Takealot, but just as an example, um, you can connect it and then your desktop then can connect to your Wi-Fi at home um, or any sort of Wi-Fi type internet. So that can also then just bring this device into play with when you can use it and install Iris on. You do have access to all your Microsoft Office applications. Um, so and just log into my life, you can install it from there. It's, there are some videos on the Adolf site as well, the website, so check it out on the YouTube channel. We do have quite a lot of videos there with regards to installing Office, for example. Uh, make sure you got the latest version of Chrome. Ideally, Chrome, as Lazarus indicated, it tends to work well, so just make sure it's up to date and make sure you clear the data and cookies. You can do a quick Google search that can help. Uh, because that just will speed up the browser itself, okay? Um, then, of course, yes, as we indicated again, you need to pretty much have these three in play, especially if it's a desktop. With a laptop, it generally is always there, so just make sure it's working correctly. There is the demo site that Lazarus was referring to, and so please make sure you use your device, go through the demo, make sure everything is running. That will definitely help you feel a little bit less stressed about the technology side of things. And I hope I've been able to give you some ideas of what you could potentially do. Thank you, Denzel, back to you. Thank you very much, David. So now you see a little bit about the requirements. And I see there are still a lot of questions about the how to, et cetera. So before we move on to the more session of what is online assessment, et cetera, I'm gonna invite my colleague Richard firstly back to the table to really do that live demonstration for us. My modules is up and running now. So let's see if we can answer some of these questions that you're posing on the chat. And then following that, I'm immediately, I'm gonna ask my colleague uh, Lazarus to immediately do a live demonstration for us of Iris as well, specifically how to hold the photo up to the camera, etc. So let's invite Richard back and while Lazarus gets prepared for the following. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Denzel. Uh, so just to also just reiterate, so there is a Iris exam preparation site where you can go and download resources, how to set up uh, Iris, and then also do a mock exam. So please, if you've got your camera, we will show this later again. You can scan the QR code or write down the URL, but we will be sharing the URL in the chat as well. So please make sure that you, as soon as possible, go set this up, uh, make sure everything is working. 
so that you do not have to worry about iris and just focus on preparing for the examinations. So just to um, go through the procedure again. So remember, you're going to log into my UNISA. You're going to go to my modules. You're going to go to the course that's been created for the supplementary exams. You're going to download your papers from there. Once you download your papers, you're going to start IRIS invigilation. It's going to run on your desktop. You're going to then write the examination. So I say on a notepad. Once you've done, you scan and upload uh, uh, your uh, question paper of the, the script, and then you stop IRIS. So let's just quickly have a look at how to do this. So firstly, you will go to my UNISA. You will sign in with your student number and uh, um, password, just as you normally do. You will go to my modules. From here, you will, for instance, go to uh, the site that's been created for the question papers. So just remember, it will not be under additional resources. It will have a separate uh, block to download the uh, question papers from, and this will be visible on the day. Now, I just want to highlight here that this is where a lot of people get stuck is you might not necessarily always see this little drop down over here. So make sure if you're on the site and you do not see the folder that contains the question papers, to click on this little drop down over here. So once you're here, you're basically going to download the question paper, open it up, you're going to start the IRIS invigilation. Iris will run uh, uh, for the duration of while you're writing, and uh, Lazarus will show you how exactly how that works. Once you're done, you can use your mobile phone to scan in, or you uh, can use a scanner. And just remember, I see a lot of questions here, you know, about getting flagged, being worried about getting flagged. So remember, being flagged is not automatically that you you're going to be indicated as that you cheated. Some a person still has to go through. It just indicates there is something perhaps they need to go look at. So they go look at that section. If you for that section you said, oh, I'm going to the bathroom, they will say, oh, okay, the person went to the bathroom. So getting flagged doesn't necessarily mean you automatically uh, are allocated as that you cheated. A person still goes through the footage and everything to make sure they have to prove that there was. Uh, academic misconduct that took place. So afterwards, once you scanned in, you can do this from your mobile phone as well. You can get just uh, go to my admin, and then you go to assessment admin, and then assignment submissions. You need to log in again with your student number and password, and then there will be a space here for you to upload. So you just upload uh, your uh, PDF document that you saved, that you scanned in, or uh, uh, any PDF that you could perhaps combine from different pictures. Just make sure everything is legible. And then once you upload it here, you go back to Iris and then you stop the Iris invigilation. So Lazarus, I hope you're ready for a quick demo of uh, how Iris exactly works. Uh, thanks, Denzel. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so let's invite Iris uh, Lazarus now to quickly give us a live demonstration of Iris. Lazarus? Uh, Lazarus, I see you mute, Lazarus. Yes, sorry, I had to maximize that yeah. quickly. Um, okay, so I'm assuming you can see my 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 modules uh, screen. Yes, you visible. Okay, so all right. Okay, so maybe we should actually start with actually where how you download the the, the iris quickly so i'm going to first go to google chrome so i said you, on google chrome you would search for the chrome web store uh, chrome web store enter you'll see it's the first one that pops up go to the chrome web store ah, okay so i don't know why i did that but uh, Chrome Web Store. Okay, I guess it's uh, it's because it's actually not the first one. In this case, it's that one. So I will type in Iris here in the search bar. Click Enter. Iris is the first one. It says here added. In your case, it's not going to say added. I'll click on it, and if I said remove from Chrome, 
and it will remove it. You'll see I had the iris icon there disappeared. Now I'm going to click on Add to Chrome, click Add Extension, and it will say Checking. And then that's it. My, my icon is back. If you want your icon to remain on, on your taskbar on the top here, you click on this little uh, puzzle piece and you click on this pin and then it will remain here. And this sometimes is useful. Uh, OK, now that Iris is installed, I go to the exam site. So I'm going to go to the Iris Prep 22. This is the CSET Iris site. I, uh, you would have the CTA Iris Prep site. So I'm going to go to the Iris Prep 2022 site. Uh, and to start, you will see, you will notice now. Uh, sorry, Denzel, can I, can I uh, quickly, I'm going to stop sharing because I want to share with audio. Uh, yes, uh, please, please, that's fine. Yeah, okay. uh, so just to recap, while Lazarus is stopping sharing, remember that you go to Google Chrome uh, and store, and that's where you find the Iris app. Okay, so once we get to this page, this will in your in terms of your when you're writing exam, this will be your exam page that you go to. It actually is. This is an assessment, but yours may look slightly different because the CTA exams are uploaded onto the additional resources folder. But you would just click on. Uh, the folder, as soon as you click on the folder, uh, Iris will pop up, okay? You will agree to the term, that's me there. You will agree to the terms and conditions. You will click on continue. Hi, I'm Iris, the Intelligent Remote Invigilation System. I'm here to guide you through the process and to help ensure academic integrity in your assessment. Remote invigilation is not about trying to catch you doing something wrong, but rather to remind you and your fellow classmates of the importance of maintaining academic integrity during assessments. Academic integrity means acting with the values of honesty, fairness and responsibility and is important to maintain your reputation and the value of your qualification. During your assessments, I will be recording from your webcam and microphone and capturing whatever is showing on your screen. So your first step is to activate a webcam by selecting from the list. Once a webcam is selected, you should see something in the panel below. Don't worry, no one will be looking at you through the camera during the assessment. However, staff involved in your unit will be able to see what you are doing when they review the recordings later. If you have more than one camera, choose the camera that will show your face from the front. Compare your image to the example here. Position yourself so that your head and shoulders are visible and take up most of the window as shown below. Try not to be too close or too far away. Make sure your face is easy to see. If your face is too dark, try shining a lamp towards you. If the background is too bright, close the curtains or shift your position so that there are no bright lights behind you. Ensure you are in a quiet location with minimal background noise, no music and where you won't be interrupted. I need to be able to hear everything that you hear and anything that might happen in the room, so you are not allowed to use headphones or earbuds. Next. Uh, sorry, sorry, Lazarus. I think you just share if you can just replay the video, but share the actual video screen itself. I think you share your desktop, but you can share the other, uh, the screen that actually shows the video. Yep. Sorry, we'll do that. Thanks. Okay. It'll be easier for students to follow. Thanks. Okay. See, there's a question. Okay, but that's we're not. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, share again. Screen. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my video. Um, no, uh, this is actually showing the Mayonisa page. Yes, but I did. I did. Okay, the video is closed. I need to open it again. Perfect. Uh, looks like my module is a bit slow today.
Uh, okay, there we go. So, so this is the, the screen that pops up. So you couldn't see it just now, but this is the pop up, uh, the artist pop up. And the lady that was, I'm assuming you could hear the sound, the lady that was, was this lady. So I'm gonna pause her this time. So she is the one that gives you instructions. On the first time you use Iris, so when you do your practice test, you have to let her talk through the whole process. But when you're writing exams, you don't have to let her talk. You can pause her and you can, then she asks you to choose your microphone and choose your camera, uh, then enter your full name. Uh, you have to enter your full name. You want to accept one name. And I'm going to put my staff ID number here. You have to enter your student number correctly, and then this button will turn purple. You can then click on next. Uh, again, it's very important. The first time you use Iris, this button will not go to next until this lady finished talking. But to save time, you can uh, pause her when you're writing examinations. This, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking there's a lot of questions that have been asked on the chat about the time required. So you have been given enough time for your examination. I think it's almost, if it's not 15 minutes, it's half an hour, but it's minimum of 15 minutes. I actually think it's half an hour you have that you actually use to write, to start IRIS and read through uh, your exam paper. So you have been given enough time. So don't worry about time in terms of activating IRIS. Uh, you have enough time, but it also Okay, so she, she just told me what I need to do. So I need to do that. That's probably fine. It will be able to pick me up if I did that. Capture ID, click on next. Uh, Lazarus, are you still with us? I'm not sure if you've got sound on your side. Uh, couldn't you hear now? No, no. I think you need to share it with the sound. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, but it's fine. You can okay. walk the students through this. If there's no sound, it's fine. Walk the students okay. through the process. Okay, so what the lady told me now, she did, was talking and she, she basically said that I need to share my screen so I was uh, letting her talk, but uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, so uh, she just told me that I need to share my screen and this is instructions on sharing your screen. We actually asked the IRIS team to put these instructions because so many students were coming back to us and saying they do not know how to share the screen. So this instructions was added to the latest version of IRIS. Uh, so in on this screen, you click OK, then you click on Start Invigilation. Okay. Once you click on Start Invigilation, this, remember I told you you have to share your screen. So you click on the share, click on your screen. So this is a copy of my screen, and I click on Share. And then now I just starting recording. So I've not done this before, but in your examinations you are required to lift up your camera so that you can see. So I'm going to do this so that my desk can be seen. So I actually have nothing on my desk. I do have a book that side. So I'm going to show the book and I'm going to show everything else that's possibly on my desk. And then I'm going to put my desk, put my camera, my laptop down again. And then I'm going to, I can minimize Iris. I can open the exam paper. It's downloaded I Can open it. I can start writing. So, and then I can go back uh, after I've done writing. I'm not going to write Then I can so I've got a different screen, doesn't allow me to upload. You would have a screen where it allows you to upload. You would upload your exam paper. Then, so Iris on this test is set for 10 minutes. In most cases, you would find that you are probably finished sooner than you than the upload time. So that your Iris will run until the end of your upload time. Your upload time is 30 minutes. Iris will run to the end of that. So what you can do, 
if IDAS is still running and you've finished, just click on stop sharing. Okay. Click on cancel. Click on. Uh, no, why is it doing this now? Uh, click on cancel. I want to try. I want to actually. Okay, what I'm going to do is just. If it does that, just close. Just leave Iris. You can close Iris. What you can do, you can you can go in here. It's actually supposed to. If I click on stop sharing, it's supposed to allow me to click on finish recording. You can glow. You can click on this little icon. Right click on it, and you click on finalize recordings. Uh, it's, if it says no sessions available for upload. OK, don't worry about that. It's actually uploading the files that I have just uploaded and then you can. Close on it. Uh, once it's done. Once it says file upload complete. You can close iris. So sorry, I'm not sure why it didn't allow me to click on finish recording. It's supposed to do that. Uh, yeah. But like I said, you can it will it should allow you to click on finish. If it doesn't, just click here and click on finalize recordings, and then your recordings would be uploaded. I think I'm done there. Uh, done now. Thanks. Thanks for that, Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus, I'm gonna ask uh, if you can actually do a full recording demo for us, and then share it on the on the link as well. I see there's a lot of students that are asking, can we please get a recording specifically of this? So if you can do a direct screen capturing specifically of the process that you've now put on, and then share it maybe on the chat so that those students who uh, who want to watch it can watch a specific uh, demo on the iris itself. Uh, Thanks, thanks for that letters. OK, colleagues, so that gives you an idea of the process and how what is to be followed. Uh, we now move on to the section of what exactly is online assessments, and I'm going to invite Dr. Salosh Govinder to unpack this a little bit for us and what are online assessments and specifically focusing on your elements itself uh, from a broader category of online assessment itself. Thanks, Salosh. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share with you a few tips and tricks on how to approach your online exams. And through our experience, we often know that students feel more stressed and anxious for the supplementary exams than, their, uh, than your main exams. So colleagues, I just want you to take a moment, all right? And I want you to reflect on why is it that you in particular are feeling more stressed for your supplementary exams than your main exams? Right, some of you may, may want to post your response in the chat, so please do uh, feel free to do so. Okay, you may consider time pressure, right? That could be a contributing factor to your stress. Having written the, the you know, the main exam, the, the October, November exams, and now you just have basically two months to study for, for your supplementary exams, you could put, uh, that could put you under tremendous uh, pressure. Another reason could be the consequences, right? For some of you, it might be the last chance for you to pass a course or to graduate on time. And failing a supplementary exam may mean delaying graduation or repeating a year, which could add to the pressure and the stress. Another contributive uh, factor could be the self-doubt and the insecurity that you now have in yourself. And you need to actually prove to other people or prove to your family now and prove to yourself that, you know, uh, you can do it. Some of you may have... Um, not done so well in your main exam because of you know a silly error, a mistake, or some you know um, yeah and, and and you don't want to repeat the mistakes, so you're actually fearful of those mistakes, right? So we are fully aware of the stress and anxiety that you're going through, and we are you know we actually want to walk this journey with you. Therefore, we chose you know. 
to to sacrifice our Saturdays just to be here here for you and to and to give you all the support that you need. Thank so you colleagues, what's left for you is just to remain calm, to plan, Salosh? to prepare. Yes, Denzel. Uh, sorry, would you just click on the the, the top display settings and oh, just sorry. swap the display? Mm. Swap. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is any better? Okay. Right. So colleagues, um, yeah, we just want you to remain calm because we believe that, um, you know, successful performance in your exam depends a lot on your emotional state, on your psychological state. So please, we want you to be in control of yourself. Right. So in this presentation now, I just want to talk to you about your exam structure, right? Uh, integration, which is quite an integral part for accounting science and how to approach case studies and how to manage your time. Right. So colleagues, if you look at um, many of you would have seen your examination gu guideline. So I just want to explain now uh, the structure of your of your examination uh, sessions. Right. So in every module, there are going to be two sessions. So you're going to write two papers on one day. So this is what the, ses the session looks like or the or, or your day of your examination will look like. Right. So the morning session, it will start at 18.15 and it would end at 12 o'clock. So here is the breakdown of your time. So from 18.15 to 18.30, that's where you are going to download your exam paper and you're going to activate IRIS. Then from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, it's your reading time. And I've seen a chat message there that uh, you want to know if um, what if you um, start writing sooner. Colleagues, the reason why we guide you with this 30 minutes reading time is intentional. If you spend too little time reading, your case study, right? You are going to miss out on important facts, concepts, accounting principles, and so forth. So we want you to really um, use the time to read with understanding, to make your notes, to do a mind map or whatever, right? So that time is very important. On the other hand, we have students who spend more than half an hour to read. And that is going to be today their detriment because it's going to leave them with very little time to complete the um, exams, right? So the 30 minutes is there to guide you. Thereafter, from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, because remember that IRIS is activated all the time, eh? From 9 to 11 o'clock, it gives you two and a half hours for you to uh, answer your questions here. You might... Um, during this time, you might want to go and reread your case study. So please do so, so please do so. Right. Understand your questions thoroughly. Look at your mark allocation. Right. And then from half past eleven, you will stop writing. And then from half past eleven to twelve o'clock, you will start uploading your answer book for the first session. Right. And remember, uh, you upload your examination answer file for paper one under assignment seven right and then if you encounter any issues on my unisa you then you'll use the contingency the contingency link as was explained by the previous presenters then you will have a lunch break from 12 to two o'clock because i know that some students have mentioned that they didn't know that they had another paper to write in the afternoon okay so this could be a very very silly error then your afternoon session now, it starts at two o'clock and it finishes at um, quarter to seven. Right. So what this means is that from quarter, to, uh, 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 sorry, it starts at, yeah, um, on a Friday, right, colleagues, please note, okay, I'll come back to the Friday part of it, right. It starts at quarter past two. So from quarter past two to quarter to three, it's a reading time. Right, let's go back. Two o'clock to quarter past two, you'll download and activate Iris. From quarter past two to quarter to three, reading time, and then your 
um, your writing time. You'll stop writing at quarter past five, and then from quarter past five to quarter to six, upload your exam paper. Please, colleagues, this is very important. So quite often, when you are approaching your exams, or um, when you're going to think about what is happening on your exam day, right? It's always good to think backwards sometimes, right? The final result. What should the final result look like? What should I be doing finally in the, in the final step of my assessment? Right. That's also a very good approach. Now, your exam timetable would look something like this here. So in this module here, right, these modules here, right, you'll see there's two papers here. Reason being because there's two exams, session one, session two and it's on one day, right? I just want to remind you that on the 17th of March, which is a Friday, there's an exception, and please take note of the time difference on the 17th, right, for these papers here. The session will, uh, the, the purpose is to accommodate religious observations on this day, and the exams will not start at two o'clock, like the other days, but on the 17th, it will start at half past two, and it's going to finish at quarter to seven. Okay, so remember now, this is how your exam paper uh, timetable is going to look like. Now, colleagues, I'm going to move on to an, another very important principle um, with the College of uh, Accounting Science, right? And the concept of integration. So in some of the, for the CTA level two, right? Each module will incorporate 20% of integration with the other CTA modules. So this is right. So in, in this module, for, for example, in other words, 80% of the content is from the these modules here. And the lecturers have been very, very kind to actually indicate to you which modules are going to be integrated in your exams. As you can see, the 20% of integration will come from these modules as indicated in your timetable as well. So um, what it then means is that the, 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 your exam paper for this module here is going to test knowledge and your ability to connect that knowledge from the module that you're doing with the other modules. So we are integrating across modules, which means that you will be able, uh, um, you will be able, uh, you are expected to apply principles, concepts, accounting principles, um, processes from the other integrated module, the 20% into your module when you're asked to solve problems and so forth, right? Because we want to be able to see um, how you're able to uh, apply the knowledge and in this way, it's going to, to demonstrate a, a more holistic understanding of your content. We do not want you to be able to demonstrate understanding of, um, you know, what can I say, through um, regurgitation and forgetting the um, knowledge from the other modules. So we want to see an integrated understanding. Right. So please take note of that. So when you are studying for this module here, it's very, very wise for you to go back to these modules where the knowledge is, good, is going to be integrated. Recap your knowledge, your understanding, right? Uh, your theories from the accounting principles that's covered there. That would be a very, very useful strategy because, uh, yeah. Now, let us move to a case study. In accounting science, um, most of the, the exam papers are going to have case studies, right? So the reason why we uh, bring in case studies is that we want students to demonstrate understanding of application skills. Because um, in accounting science, a lot of critical um, thinking, problem solving, analytical thinking, um, evaluation is all required here. Right, colleagues, um, I can talk from experience because I, I have a daughter who was um, who was qualified as a CA 
And she's been going through all this. And quite often, you know, we talk about what are the requirements and uh, and so forth. And quite often she tells me that although um, one would think that accounting is about numbers, you know, it's about having mathematical knowledge. She says that in her view, accounting is a lot about communication skills and problem solving and analytical thinking and so forth. Even in her current workplace where she's practicing, she's not practicing as a CA, but she's practicing as a project manager, but she uses the um, the knowledge and the competencies she gained in a qualification to help her in her job. Right, so this is critical as well. So case studies is what does that to you. It helps you to integrate concepts, key concepts of modules to apply theories in the practical context and to actually see exactly what is happening in the actual workplace. Right. So quite often, if one asks, OK, what knowledge and skills and competencies do I need to be able to work successfully with a case study or to answer case study questions successfully? I want to bring in this analogy, right? Think of a case study as being like a puzzle. And if you think of a puzzle, a puzzle is about putting pieces together and looking for clues. Similarly, in a case study as well, you'll find so many different ideas, so many different issues, problems within a case study. Now, what it means is, is that you got to identify all these kind of pieces and see what you can eventually do with those pieces. OK, so always think of a case study as being like a puzzle. Breaking it down into manageable sizes. Right. When you are doing a puzzle, you don't just look at a big picture. And because what you do is you've got to fit the smaller pieces together. If you have a puzzle of maybe um, um, a person, right? I'm just, just using a very simple example, a person. You'll first put all the, uh, the, you'll find all the colors that would go for the person's shirt. All the colors that would go for the person's uh, shorts, for example, right? So breaking it down into manageable pieces, you do small parts first and then you'll continue. Concentration, when you're doing a puzzle, you do not want to be um, disturbed. So like that, a case study as well, you need full concentration. Le do not let your thoughts divert. Right. Concentrate on what you have read. Get all your focus, all your energy in your reading now, in your case study. Right. As you're concentrating, try to think about, oh, where about is this concept um, positioned in my study material? Is it in um, unit three? Is it in unit four? Oh, I see it's in the other module. So try to find a relationship, make connection with what you are reading with the theory in your book. Right. Attention to detail. Sometimes you'll think that, OK, why is all this information here? What, is, what has it got? What has it got to, to do with the case? No, there is something that it is telling you. So also give attention to do to those details. Problem solving, right? Every case study has a problem. Every case study has a problem. So when you are reading a case study, you need to take note of the problems. And immediately, if you see something as a problem, try to highlight it. Try to take note of it. And then as you go on reading, why is this a problem? Look at your financial principles. Look at your financial statements that's in, in, in your case studies. Look at the transactions that's in your case studies. Why is that problematic? What is it that's causing the problem there? And then critical thinking. This comes when you're communicating. Right. And when you're, when, when you're thinking. So always think of a case study as being, um, as requiring multiple competencies. Right, your knowledge, your skills, your understanding, concentration, and so forth. <clears throat> now, here's some very manageable 
strategies for, for approaching your case studies, right? And three basic steps. Identify the issue, try to look for solutions, and your recommendations. So if you had to break that three parts into steps. So when you are reading now, make sure that you read the case study carefully to understand the context, the issues, and the facts. Look for these things. Right, what is the context? Why is the problem happening? Happening. What are the issues in, in, in this context and what are the facts? What background facts influence the current problems referred to in the question? Right, and how do they relate to the accounting principles or how do you re uh, relate the accounting principles and the concepts and the terminologies and the theories you have studied to what is actually happening in the case studies. Now you are drawing from what you know into this year. What are the constraints and obstacles of the situation? Then step two, now you are going to identify the problem. Okay, you know the context. Now you're trying to find out what is, what are the problems. You go back and you reread the case study. You identify the key issues. And now, you, in this stage, now you are gathering the information. Collect all the relevant information from the case study and any other sources that may be necessary for a complete analysis. Because you are analyzing the case study now. This is what sometimes in your question, you will see the word analyze. Analyze the, uh, the problem of or whatever. Identify the problem in case study and analyze the um, reasons why or whatever. Right. Then evaluate the evidence. Now you've got all the evidence and you've got to evaluate. So when you are evaluating, what it means is you need to seek explanations. You need to look in your problem solving and try to explain why is the, why is the problem happening and interpretations. Try to look for clues. Think of it as a puzzle, right? Identify the issue and see how you can interpret the, that issue and how that, in, that issue is impacting on the problem. Okay, examine the implications. Right, this is all part of identifying the problems, right? There's a problem. If there's a problem in any uh, scenario, it affects stakeholders, it affects industry, it affects the workplace, right? So this is the implications. Then step three is linking the theory to problems and case evidence, linking the problem to the theory. I mean, as I said to you, that when we talk about integration, look at the problem and see, OK, where in which module do I link it? In which chapter of my study material do I link this problem to? Right. Um, and then your step four is the solution part. You might find that, you know, sometimes you you will come up with many solutions and you'll think that, oh, uh, but the question asks for only one solution. What do you do in that case? Right. When you come up with many solutions, you evaluate the advantages and the disadvantages of the multiple solutions that you came up with. And then you then you'll say, you know, this is the best solution for the problem. And then remember that when you are writing, when you're communicating now, make sure that you structure your writing very logically and coherently. A very good idea is to use headings and headings where you're using terminology that is, um, you know, con uh, that is consistent with accounting science, accounting principles. Immediately you tell the examiner that, that the examiner gets a sense that, oh, the student knows what she's talking about. OK, and then you make recommendations. And again, I want to emphasize the use of appropriate terminologies and concepts, accounting principles. Colleagues, I know that uh, we've been advocating for glossaries to be used in multilingual languages in many of the modules, right? So if you if you have a glossary list that has been translated into the different African languages where you need uh, you know, your understanding to be explained further in your own African language, please, please, please look at those glossary lists just to give you an understanding of those concepts. Right. Lastly, 
manage your time effectively. Read the instructions carefully. And I'm going back to this here because when you read your instructions carefully, then this will help you to identify the scope of the question. And it will avoid, help you to avoid wasting time on irrelevant information. Therefore, your instruction is very important. What is the instruction asking you to do? Compare, analyze, uh, solve a problem, um, provide recommendations. Look at these keywords, right? Then allocate a specific time for each question based on the allocation of the mark for each question. Where you see a question is allocated more mark, then naturally you will allocate more time for that particular question. Do not get stuck on one question because it's going to disadvantage you and prevent you from answering all the other questions. I know, going back to my daughter, so many times she used to come back home and say, Mom, you know what? I messed up with the paper because I spent too much of time and the easier questions were right at the end and I left them out and I feel so disappointed about that. Don't find yourself in that, that situation. Before you start writing your, your answers, create a plan on outline of your response. But have a plan, colleagues. Sometimes, you know what we tend to do? We um, want to write everything that we know from our head into that question paper. Whether it is relevant or not, most of the time, irrelevant. So plan your answers, right? This will help you to structure your answer and ensure that you cover the most important points. If you're running short of time, use bullets, right? And use um, full sentences, but do not put in unnecessary information. So this is what we say, write concisely. Keep track of your time as you answer each question, because then you know how much of time you, you have left. If you're running out of time, move on to the next question and come back to the, and complete the one that you're not sure of, right? After completing all the questions, review your answers and make any necessary corrections or additions. And then uh, colleagues, I want to conclude with this here. Always say to yourself, I know I can do it. It's because we know that you can do it. Okay, think positive and remember that UNISA is here to give you all the support that you possibly need. Thank you so much, colleagues, and all the best in your exams. Thank you very much, Salosh, for that and for unpacking exactly how the exam process works. Uh, colleague, just a just a quick recall. Salosh mentioned the twenty percent integration. Please take note of that. I see there are many questions on the uh, on the issue of the twenty percent integration of other modules. So please take note of that. That's a very important one for you to understand. And there are various comments being posted on including comments from the colleagues from the uh, College of Accounting Sciences, the academics, uh, etc. And uh, so please look at the chat. It actually unpacks uh, the 20 percent and why that 20 percent is important and why we are actually stressing in these presentations the integration of that 20 percent. So please take note of that as you are preparing for your examination. Uh, don't get stuck with not working, with not uh, studying for the 20 percent, not realizing the 20 percent. It is critical that you focus uh, on the chat and what is happening within that 20 percent as well. We now move on to the uh, almost the last part, the support contact, support center contact details. Uh, Richard, if you may quickly uh, walk us through that. Thanks, Richard. Hey, thank you, Daniel. So remember the support contact center is available. So the toll free numbers are available on the screen. We will put it in the chat as well. So if you have any technical problems or general questions, please make sure to uh, have this number ready so that you can find them on the day. Um, so as mentioned, we will put the, the contact information in the chat as well. So I just quickly want to re-emphasize the procedure for what you will do during your writing. So you will download your papers from my modules. You will start IRIS. You will write it out on a notepad. You will scan in and then upload uh, the your script to my uh, admin under uh, assignments. And then finally, you will stop IRIS once you've completed uploading. So we did have a few questions, you know, can I upload it from the mobile device that I use to scan in? So yes, as long as IRIS is still running on your laptop, your desktop, uh, when you do something, just let it know, okay, I'm scanning and uploading, for instance, you know, maybe your power tripped and you have to go to the generator quickly. Just tell it what it is doing. Remember, even though you get flagged, it's not automatically that you 
going to be seen as cheating, there is still a person that will review uh, the content uh, from the invigilation. And then, as always, read the guides. The guides will be sent through to you. Uh, so make sure all the most of the questions are answered in these guides. The procedures provided in these guides, and as the law should be integrated, make sure of the dates and times. And the, the, some of the dates are and times are different from others. So just make sure where it does uh, change. And remember, you do get uh, 30 minutes for reading and then two and a half hours for the actual writing of the, the question paper. Um, so please, yes, make sure you've got access to the guides and uh, go through the guides, uh, you know, fully make notes of, you know, the contact information when something goes wrong. So you do have that ready on the day. So there is also in the guides provided alternative links. So say you are struggling to upload to uh, Mayonisa, uh, say the uh, assignments tool, there is alternative links as well. So make sure these links are in the guides. Make sure you do have them handy if you are having trouble. So this is just your last result if you are struggling to upload to uh, my admin. Then finally also the recordings will be uh, for this day. If we do know there's a lot of information, you might want to go review a bit on the iris sections or any of the sections that was covered. The recording will be made available. I will share the link in the chat now as well. So just note on this page, so this is the My Exams Online Guides. You just scroll down to Webinar Recordings, and we will make the recording available uh, once the recording has been generated uh, today. So yes, so from outside, good luck with the exams. I will hand over back to Denzel just for some uh, common, uh, commonly asked questions during the session. Thanks, Denzel. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for that. And also for the recap of where the students could find the recordings for this session and any additional guides. Uh, so, uh, co colleagues, just to remember, as Richard pointed out, please uh, visit these sites for the recordings for the my exam guides, as well as uh, you will have any comments or questions in those spaces. Now, we've seen a whole lot of questions, and unfortunately, we will not be able to address every single question. Uh, we do have a, uh, we will have a uh, more trainings coming up as well to prepare you for these uh, upcoming exams as well. So let me ask my colleague David to quickly just filter David to let's just look at two of the most dominant questions that have appeared in our chat. Uh, thanks, David. All right, thanks, Denzel. OK, a couple of questions that did sort of repeat themselves. Um, does Iris have access to all my documents on my computer? or just what is displayed on my screen. Um, so pretty much what happens is Iris is just recording and it's recording you using the camera and your mic. So it's not going through your files. It's not looking through any of your documents in on your computer. It's not designed that way. So you do not have to worry if this app is actually intruding, especially on a work computer where there's very uh, sort of private confidential information. So yes, you don't have to worry about that. It's only applicable when you start the application for your exam session that you're going to be going through. Um, the other question that's coming up quite a lot is does Iris have a countdown timer? Um, so maybe Lazarus, could you maybe just answer this question with regards to the countdown side of things? Uh, yes, it is. It does have a countdown timer. It does not inform you how many minutes you have left. But if you if it's maximized on your screen and you, you're looking at yourself and you can see the video, then you, there is a countdown. There's a count up and a countdown timer. There. So the one goes up, the one goes down. Yes, so it does. All right, thank you, Lazarus. And uh, the other question that is coming up, and unfortunately we can't bypass it, it's got to do with load shedding. Uh, so maybe Ms. Khamalani could come in and step in. I know you did post a few times uh, during the chat with regards to UNISA's stance on load shedding, uh, but maybe just for all the attendees, could you maybe just uh, give the students uh, sort of a point in terms of the load shedding? Uh, thank you, David. And it's actually one of our pain points for all of different industries uh, within South Africa that uh, services get disrupted 
everyone gets inconvenienced by um, load shedding. But what we have we have looked through what other um, universities are also doing around this matter, and we see that it it's a, it's a near possibility for us to halt services because of load shedding and practically because we also have our students geographically dispersed into different um, areas. So we are unable uh, uh, to manage students uh, schedules. Hence, we say to students, if they can please then alternatively visit uh, their friends, visit uh, public areas where they know that it could be a silent examination for them. And for example, the libraries, um, they, they they do have access to also our regional centers. However, uh, they must know that when they do go to the regional centers, um, the regions will be servicing other students. So there's no priority area uh, that will be provided to students. So plan a according to your load shedding um, schedule. And, and, and it has worked because we have done this over three years. There's some modules that also affect other colleges besides CSETs or other students besides CSETs who they have to write on the IRS app. So uh, we, we see students being able to manage in this regard. Some of the noises I, I have learned within the three year experience running examinations uh, is mostly from de um, detractors. We know that even amongst the session, we have those uh, suppliers with us uh, being the loudest voices against the utilization of IRS. We are dealing with uh, the unfortunate instances of one apple spoiling, having the potential to spoil the whole bag. And therefore, we need to do all our might to ensure that the UNICEF qualifications are still protected. And to do so, we have uh, done uh, feasibilities into alternatives. Uh, one of the alternatives was venues, and we came out to say that that will not be a feasible uh, option for us at the moment. So therefore, we will remain online and then utilize a stronger proctoring tool to ensure that students' examination sessions are individually recorded so that we can then have evidence against um, the number of uh, uh, unbecoming behavior that we are seeing of students uh, cheating and unfortunately purchasing these answer scripts from those uh, suppliers. It's, it, it's, it's truly a disturbing matter for us, um, for the institution, but mostly so for uh, CTA students who are the custodians of governance, they're meant to be the key defenders, but we see them uh, engaging in these activities. So just for load shedding, plan for your load shedding. Even if you go to a regional center, you must still plan. Um, when I was doing 13, let me see how, I think 15 years ago when I wrote my CTA, uh, my ITC examination, they used to say you must plan for the route to go to the venue so that if anything happens on the day, uh, you would know the alternative route that you can utilize. Because we understand that sometimes life uh, may work against us and introduce factors that are outside our controls, but then we will then need to to ensure that we have mitigated against um, whatever that will come about on the day. So plan against your load shedding schedules. If you go to the regions, plan against their own load shedding schedules and plan against their own connectivity to ensure that you're not at a region and then suddenly uh, something doesn't work out. So wherever you choose to write the examination, please plan for that. Uh, we have seen that students are able to do so. Uh, we do have historical data to, 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 to back up that students are able to utilize um, the, or go through their examination systems, even under these um, uncertain circumstances we are in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bandiwe. Much appreciated. Uh, back over to you, Denzel. Thank you very much, David, for that. And I think uh, Ms. Kamalani actually uh, 
brought the brought the conversation right back to where the acting executive dean actually started as well. The issue of why we find ourselves in this place, partly because of the academic integrity issues, the issue of the uh, quality of showing the assessments that you have at the end of the day, and really thinking of how do we ensure that we have an uh, an exam that stands up to integrity at the end of the day. And uh, you've heard from the various speakers the challenges that we are having with the institution and how it has come to this point of where we are. So I know that many of you are still having challenges. Why are we going with this route? But remember, at the end of the day, this really benefits you as a student to ensure that the qualification that you have at the end of the day really stands the merit for what it's worth. And I think that's one of the most important points for UNISA at this moment is that we we want to ensure that the, the processes that are being followed, that when you write an exam, that you can really write an exam that at the end of the day, when you get the marks and your qualification, that it stands the merit of what it's worth. So Ms. Kamalani really brought the conversation really back to that key issue of where we are as an institution and why we are taking some of these decisions. I know there are also many issues with load shedding, et cetera, that are partly brought to us by um, the challenges we are living in this country. And we will need to look at how we plan around some of these issues as well. So we're now come to the end of the session, colleagues, and it's been great having you for almost two full hours with us. I mean, if you look at two full hours, it's almost uh, sitting and writing an exam paper, and you've literally went through two full hours with us. Uh, with your devices, with your connectivity, and with the challenges of load shedding as well. So we thank you for your time, for commenting with us on this Saturday. I also want to recognize quickly the, the team that have facilitated uh, the members of staff from the College of Accounting Sciences, the school directors that have also been with us, uh, the executive, acting executive dean that has taken the time to really provide that introductory words to you to set the context so that you have the voice of the college and it's not just silence from the UNISA, you've engaged with the college, you've heard the voice of the college on these issues as well. Um, and also for you, we had almost just close, just over 270 plus, close to 280 plus students that are on the platform uh, engaging with us. And we thank you for your time. We really wish you all the best in the upcoming examinations. And uh, we know that it can be a stressful period. And this is why we have created these spaces to engage you, to provide that support for you and uh, to bring in some comfort, some a little comfort as you start writing these exams. So we know that you will be stressed. We, we hope that you will take this uh, in the stride of really providing uh, a quality mechanism for you at the end of the day. So we wish you all the best uh, as you prepare for the upcoming examination. And uh, please remember, take it easy, prepare yourself. And I think the words that we went out was plan, plan for, uh, plan strategically, plan so that you reduce the stress on yourselves. Uh, with that said, colleagues, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We wish you all the best for the rest of the Saturday and the rest of the weekend. Uh, and please take care of yourselves as we prepare for the upcoming examination. Thanks, colleagues, and uh, we goodbye from all of us. Thank you.